we'll start with the first paper, which is the coin problem with applications to data stream by Mark Braverman, Sumega Garg, and David Woodruff. And I guess Sumega is going to give us the short version of the paper. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the organizers and thanks for all uh, all of you to tune in to the talk. Uh, today I'll be talking about the coin problem with applications to data streams. This is joint work with Mark and David and I'm Sumeka. So the coin problem that we study is defined as follows. You have given a stream of n identically and independently drawn uniform random bits, x1 to xn, and you want to output the majority of this uh, majority of these n bits at the end of the stream. You need to be correct only with high probability over the uniform distribution, which is the input distribution in this case. The following algorithm solves for majority. What you do is you just keep the count of the sum, uh, keep the track, keep track of the sum of x1 to xi, uh, and this requires login space to store the count. Uh, at the end of the stream, you see if the count is greater than one, uh, greater than zero, or less than zero to compute the majority of the stream. Uh, this this algorithm would be correct on uh, is a deterministic algorithm which is correct on every input uh, stream. Now the question is, can you do better in terms of the memory required to compute majority when you only need to be correct with high probability over the uniform distribution. Some of the related work, the coin problem uh, studied in the previous work is defined as follows. You want to distinguish between these two cases. Either you are given n identically and independently drawn uniform coins, or you are given n identically and independently drawn uh, coins or bits with bias of half plus delta towards one. That is each coin is one with probability half plus delta. Uh, note that if you solve for majority on a uniform distribution, it suffices to distinguish between, uh, between, this two, uh, between these two uh, distributions for, for a certain delta, which is theta of uh, one by square root n. And in the literature, the best known lower bound uh, in the streaming setting uh, for time variant algorithms is omega log log one by delta, which is omega log log n for such delta. Uh, that's all, uh, this for for uh, proving a lower for for delta for proving a lower bound on majority. I want to also mention uh, a one work on uh, related work on counting. Uh, it, it it has been shown that counting within a factor of a uh, constant factor of one plus epsilon or solving for majority requires omega log n space. Then you will ask the question that why isn't, how, how is the question that we ask different from what is, has already been proved, proven? So the, so the point is that these results are worst case over the input. That is, these show a memory lower bound for algorithms that are correct on every input, but with high probability over the randomness used. And what we want is a memory lower bound uh, for algorithms that, uh, that are correct uh, with high probability over the uniform distribution. That is, we want an average case lower bound. But that is exactly what we prove. We prove that any one plus C streaming algorithm, which outputs the majority bit with uh, at least 0 0.999 probability over the input distribution, which is the uniform distribution, requires omega log n space. To do so, we uh, study the following n party communication model, where the ith party receives the ith input bit, and the communication is allowed only from party pi to pi plus one. The communication model that we study is a one-way one communication model where the uh, one-way communication model and it's one shot, that is the first party sends a message to the second party and the second party sends a message to the third party and so on. And then in the end, the nth party needs to output the majority bit or needs to compute whatever a streaming algorithm uh, uh, want, uh, uh, is, is required to compute. So it is easy to see that uh, any stream algorithm can be simulated by an end, by such a one way an end party communication protocol. What PI the ith party does is PI sends message MI, which is the memory state after reading I bits to PI plus one. And knowing the message state from PI minus one, which is the memory state MI minus one and its ith input bit, it is able to, and some randomness, it is able to compute this, uh, uh, this, mes uh, this message MI. And, the, and giving giving a valid uh, n-party communication protocol. 
let i given b uh, let i uh, semicolon b given c represent the mutual information between a and b conditioned on c uh, these are random variables then in this paper we define a new notion of information cost for such n party one way communication protocols or streaming algorithms m which are the, these this notion of information cost is appropriate for proving strong lower bounds for uh, memory lower bounds for streaming algorithms so the information new notion of information cost is defined as follows let m be the streaming algorithm or the corresponding communication protocol then the information cost of m is defined as you take sum of sum over i which is which ranges from 1 to n then sum over j from 1 to i it is the mutual information between mi and xj conditioned on mj minus 1 that is it is the mutual information between the uh, memory state mi after reading the i, I uh, input bits the, uh, the mutual information between this memory state mi and the jth input bit xj conditioned on the memory state just before reading the jth input bit to define any uh, mutual information you need to define the uh, distributions of these random variables here x is drawn from the uniform distribution over minus 1 1 to the n and mi is the random variable denoting the message and memory state mi and the distribution of mi is dictated by the uniform distribution on the input distribution and the private randomness or the randomness used by the stream algorithm okay so um, uh, in this paper our main theorem is a variance information trade off that is we prove that for any epsilon greater than 0 there exists a delta such that if the information cost of this uh, streaming algorithm m is less than equal to delta n log n then the expected variance of the sum of the input stream uh, uh, of the bits in the input stream conditioned on the output of the streaming algorithm uh, is greater than equal to 1 minus epsilon times n that is it is epsilon close to the maximum variance uh, in the sum possible an intuitive way to understand this uh, this trade off uh, is that if the information cost of this protocol m is less than equal to delta n log n then this stream this streaming algorithm m is not able to approximate uh, estimate the count of uh, the count or the sum of the input bits uh, very well so uh, this is the, uh, this is our main theorem uh, or the main technical theorem and then we uh, using this theorem we can prove the prove the memory lower bound for computing majority over the uniform distribution why because first we show that the distribution of the sum axi conditioned on the output of m which computes majority with 0.999 advantage has low variance and be because it has low variance that means the information cost needs to be high that is the information cost of m is greater than equal to delta n log n uh and indeed and and further we prove that this information cost of any streaming algorithm as we defined uh if few few slides back is upper bounded by n times r where r is the memory size of m this proves that any algorithm that computes majority with 0.999 advantage has uh, has to have delta n delta log n memory okay so after that we prove almost tight uh, lower bounds for uh, solving multiple and randomly interleaved copies of the coin problem as well as for solving the odd of multiple copies of a variant of the coin problem we are able to lift these lower bounds to various streaming problems in the bounded deletion model and random order model because we started with proving a, a lower bound on a uniform distribution for the coin problem we end up with to uh, giving hard distributions for uh, streaming uh, for various streaming problems which are appropriate to prove lower bounds in the bounded deletion model and the random model model uh because of time limitation i would uh, i i would not go into the applications to the data streams but this is a slide uh, this is my last slide and it shows the various lower bounds that uh, some of the various lower bounds that we proved in the uh, streaming uh, algorithm setting 
uh, one to say one line, we are able to prove matching lower bounds in the bounded deletion and the random order model, which are more restrictive forms of model, uh, uh, where where the lower bounds were only known in the most general, which is model, which are which is the turnstile model. Okay. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, trying to check if there are any questions. There are none on Slack that I can see. Um, let me just see. Um, yeah, so um, it doesn't seem like anyone has any questions. So actually, I wanted to uh, actually ask you uh, to maybe go briefly through the new, like the extension bounds, like the new lower bounds that you're able to prove by leveraging the technique. So for the streaming, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so for the stream, for, for example, for the L2 point uh, query problem, where uh, we're uh, where at the end of the, okay, so, uh, uh, okay, I'm, a, uh, do, should I explain uh, the model, the problem for L2 estimation? Yeah, maybe, I, I, at least I'm not very familiar with it, so I guess it, okay. it, it would help. So, yeah. so like, okay, let's go, let's look at this particular problem, then mm -hmm. here X, X is a d-dimensional vector which uh, mm -hmm. which which is initialized to zero, and then you and and then at each time step you you get uh, like you get an update to a coordinate of x that is like mm -hmm. okay update the jth coordinate with plus or minus one and so mm -hmm. on and then in you get these updates in a stream and then for example you want to estimate the L2 norm of x at the mm -hmm. end of the stream mm -hmm. after these updates. So we knew that uh, you, it requires uh, log m by epsilon square memory in the turnstile model, where in the turnstile model is that you prove a lower bound against algorithms that are uh, uh, that are correct on, with high probability that that are correct on every uh, every sequence of the uh, stream updates. So every sequence sequence of the updates it is correct with high probability. That is, if you get uh, X, X1, uh, you can get a very weird looking uh, stream of updates and it, it still needs to be correct on that stream. But then you, it, the question is that maybe you can get better upper bounds for in the bounded deletion model where, where you restrict to be, you, you are required to be correct only on input streams such that satisfies this property that the L2 norm never goes at any time step, never is never small, alpha, times is never smaller than alpha times the L2 norm of and at any other previous time step. Is that clear? Or like a random order model where the you need to be correct with high probability over the order of the updates. That is the and the order is treated to be random. And then these 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 basically try to capture that the stream the stream of updates can have nicer properties. Uh, uh, nicer properties, and then uh, we are able to prove lower bounds even in those settings. So, uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, how many players do you need at a minimum to get the log and lower bound for majority? So, that's a good question. Uh, So, uh, so one thing is you cannot do it for with two players. Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think you'll get log number of players. Yeah. So like log n players. It no, it will be log <laughs> number of players. Uh -huh. Okay. So if you want a log n bound, you need n to the epsilon players. But I think it's it's basically you you get you you have to spend one bit per scale. And so it's log number of players. Okay. Because whatever number of players you have, if you do just the majority of majorities, you'll have some decent approximation. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, sorry, I just uh, briefly got disconnected there. Um, so I, I think um, we're done with questions for now. Um, and I, okay, thank you. Um, and, I believe there's still one question in the uh, in the Slack, but maybe you can uh, discuss it uh, over there. So um, yes. I think yeah. So I think we're going to go to the next 
uh, paper in this uh, session, which is optimal streaming approximations for all bo Boolean max to CSPs and max k sets. Thanks, Dan. Can I go ahead and share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Works. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Santosh. Is giving the talk. Sorry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> no worries. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Santoshni. Uh, today I'll be presenting our work on optimal streaming approximations for Boolean max to CSPs and max KSAT. This is joint work with Sasha and Shini. Um, in this work, we characterize the approximability of every Boolean max to CSP in the streaming model. Let's start uh, with a simple uh, example of a CSP, like a max card, where uh, the problem is given an undirected graph G, we want to find the bipartition that maximizes the number of edges that go across uh, the bipartition. And in this example, G is bipartite, and therefore max card is simply the number of edges, which is four. In the streaming model, this problem can be formulated this way, where every edge of the graph is received one by one in a stream. And the goal is to compute the max cut value of the graph in polylog in space. Now, uh, exact computation is again hard. Um, so we look at gamma approximation algorithms for this sort of problem where the goal uh, of the sorry, algorithm is- Sorry, I just wanted to mention that we can't see the slides advancing. So in case um, you're oh, trying to- you, you, Sorry, uh, I didn't get you. You're not able to see the slides. Um, so we're, uh, in case you're trying to change slides, we cannot see them. We can only see the first slide. Oh, I'm actually switching slides here. It's no, we can only see the first one. If you are in dark mode on Adobe, uh, then maybe turning off the dark mode might help. Like this is something that I've faced oh. before. Or, oh, sorry, this. So I'm using Keynote. We, That's what we I'm can using. we can certainly see the slides now. Um, I guess you could go on slide by slide, or you can try uh, playing again. Um, does this work? Are you able, I'm switching slides. Are you able to nope. see that? No, we can only see the first one. It's all right. Okay. Uh, these things happen. So uh, maybe maybe do it this way, if you don't mind. Okay. I think it should be okay. But yeah, I think I would be missing out on animations. Uh, let me try something else. Uh, is it working now or? Sure, take your time. Okay. Oh yeah, this is this works. Yeah, sure. This works. Okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay. No, no, no problem at all. Like, thanks for interrupting, Ashley. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, I'll just restart. Um, okay. Uh, in this work, we characterize the approximability of every Boolean max two CSP in the streaming model. So to start with, uh, let's look at the max cut problem where uh, given an undirected graph G, the goal is to find the bipartition that maximizes the number of edges that go across the bipartition. And in this case, G is just bipartite and max cut value is four. So in the streaming model, um, uh, the way we formal, uh, uh, formulate this problem is where the edges of the graph are received one by one. And uh, you have to compute the max cut value of this graph in just polylog in space. So this exact computation is hard. So we consider gamma approximation algorithms, which output a value between gamma opt and opt. And uh, first of all, we can observe that max cut has a trivial uh, half approximation algorithms, namely where you simply count the number of edges and output M over two. On the other hand, a recent line of work shows that this is the best that you can do for max cut in the streaming model. That is any better than half approximation requires omega N space. Okay, so we consider a related problem, max die cut, where you are given a directed graph this time, and you want to find a directed partition in the sense that you have a left set and a right set, and you want to maximize the number of edges that go from left to right. And uh, in our previous work with Guruswami and Velinkar, we showed that unlike max cut, max die cut is not approximation resistant in the sense that you can beat the trivial one fourth approximation and we showed that two-fifth approximation is possible, okay? This is what we show in this work. In this work, we first improve the approximation ratio for max die cut to four over nine, 
And we also established that this is the best that you can do in the sense that any better than four over nine approximation algorithm requires omega square root of n space. We also show that uh, CSPs like 2XR or 2XR are, are approximation resistant. And uh, max Ksat for all k greater than or equal to two, uh, the exact approximation ratio turns out to be square root of two over two. Um, okay, let's get started. Uh, first, I'll describe the algorithm. In the rest of the talk, I'll be using max die cut as a running example to explain our both algorithmic and the lower bound techniques, but they pretty much extend to the other CSPs as well. Okay, so let's first start with the previous two-fifth approximation algorithm. What lies at the heart of this algorithm is a quantity known as, uh, we define as the bias of a graph. So here's the definition. First, bias of a vertex is simply the difference between the out degree and the in degree of the vertex. And bias of the graph is just some of the absolute values of the biases of the individual vertices. Uh, it is easy to observe that we can estimate bias in the streaming model using standard uh, classical L1 norm estimation algorithms. Now, what we showed in the previous work is that the die cut value of a graph is very closely related to the bias that we compute. In the sense that the red line that we show here is like the lower bound on the die cut value and the blue line is like the upper and upper bound on the die cut value in terms of bias. So the algorithm is simply to estimate the bias and then output the value according to the red line. And you can observe that the uh, bottleneck for such an algorithm occurs somewhere around bias m over two. And this is where the uh, lower and upper bound ratio turns out to be two fifth. And that's why we have a two fifth approximation algorithm. Um, all right, and uh, the right line uh, lower bound we got by considering the greedy die cut, where if the vertex if a vertex has a larger out degree than in degree, you simply place it in the left set, and on the other hand, if it has a larger in degree, you place it in the right set, and call this the D die cut and measure what the die cut value of such a um, die cut is. Uh, what we show in our current work is that this lower bound is actually not optimal in low bias regions. We show that instead of greedy die cut, if you carefully consider a distribution on die cuts based on bias, this gives a slightly better lower bound than the previous lower bound. And this also turns out to improve the bottleneck that we had previously. And this gives us the four over nine approximation. In the rest of the talk, I'll describe the space lower bound that we get, which surprisingly shows that this is the best you can do in streaming model, that this four over nine approximation indeed is the optimal approximation ratio for die cut, right? So uh, also we show that a similar bias-based algorithm for max Ksat achieves square root of two over two approximation for all K. Okay, uh, let's look at lower bounds. Uh, we, for, to, in order to prove the lower bounds, we use the following communication problem called the distributional Boolean hidden partition problem. This was used by uh, Caprilo, Kana, and Sudhin to prove that max cut is approximation resistant. We use a sort of a similar version of the same problem. So let's see what this is. So Alice gets a random bipartition of a vertex set, and Bob gets a random edge, uh, an edge incidence matrix of a random graph. Bob also gets a vector W that lies in this edge space. And W, you can think about it as just a vector that picks a subset of the um, edges in the graph that Bob receives, okay? So there are two different distributions. Uh, so in the yes distribution, the W vector is such that it picks all the uh, edges that are exactly present in, uh, in the bipartition that Alice chooses. And in the no distribution, the edges uh, picked by the vector W are those edges that are not in the bipartition. So the, uh, so the task is for, it's a one-way communication problem where Alice is allowed to send a single uh, message to Bob. And in the end, Bob has to distinguish whether their inputs come from the yes or the no distribution. And uh, previous work show that distinguishing yes and no distribution requires at least square root of n space. Now we'll see how we will use this uh, communication complexity lower bound to prove the space lower bound for the max die cut problem. Okay. So now Alice, she looks at her bi uh, bipartition and then adds some uh, directed edges that go across this bipartition. In some sense, these are the edges that are going to contribute to the bias of the graph that Alice and Bob are gonna build together. 
Now, Alice looks at, say that there is a streaming algorithm that can, uh, with some particular uh, approximation ratio that can solve Max Nyquist. Alice is just going to pass these edges through the streaming algorithm, and in the end, sends the state of the memory to Bob. Now, Bob looks at those edges that are picked by the vector w, makes them directed uh, as shown in the figure, and then continues the execution of the streaming algorithm on this, these edges. Observe that the edges added by Bob do not contribute to the bias of the directed graph. So the way we do this reduction is such that for the same bias of the graph, depending upon whether Bob gets his input or Alice and Bob get their input from uh, the yes or the no distribution, the um, max dicot value of the graph that they construct either matches the upper bound that we show, which is in the yes case, or matches the lower bound that we show in the no case. Specifically, if we adjust the bias so that we get the bottleneck ratio, uh, in the yes distribution, the max die cut value is at least three over five, and in the no distribution, it's at most four over 15. This shows that if they have, a if there is a better than four over nine approximation algorithm for streaming, uh, for this max die cut in the streaming model, then Bob can use that algorithm to distinguish between their uh, inputs in the yes or no distribution. Therefore, from the previous um, communication complexity bound that we saw, this implies that any better than four over nine approximation requires at least omega square root of n space. Um, using similar reactions, we can show that uh, for max two sat, doing better than one over square root of two approximation requires omega square root of n space. And uh, like using a similar simple reduction to max cut, we can show that CSPs like two exact R and two XR uh, require omega n space. Um, so the punchline is the following. So for every two CSP, Either the simple bias based algorithm or the trivial random approximation algorithm is optimal. Um, so these are the future directions that we are currently pursuing, like um, extension to higher arity Boolean max CSPs, extension to max CSPs that depend on larger alphabet size rather than just Boolean. And finally, improving our omega square root of n space lower bounds to uh, linear lower bounds. Um, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Um, Thank you. Sure, thank you for the talk. Um, so, um, is there, are there any questions from the audience? I guess not. There's someone typing in. It's in order to continue the, uh, sorry, in order to count the biases, do you need to take uh, logarithmic space per any vertex to count, to count the bias, meaning that it results in a semi-assuming algorithm? Or, so how do you, how, how, how can we count the bias? Okay, that's a very good question. So we actually do not compute the bias for every single vertex. So we only want to compute the bias for the entire graph. And the way we do it is like, you can think about this as like an L1 norm estimation problem. So let's look at the bias vector. Initially, let ju let's just initialize it to all zeros or something. And then uh, let's say you get a new edge. It's a directed edge and it points from, let's say I to J. And what we would do is like, essentially it's like updating the coordinate xi by plus one, but the coordinate xj by minus one or something, because bias of a vertex is just, uh, it's out degree minus in degree. So this is exactly like the problem which Sumega mentioned before, where you have a vector at each time step, you are getting some bounded plus minus one updates to coordinates of the vector. And in the end, uh, she described an L1, L2 norm estimation, but what we need is an L1 norm estimation of this particular vector. And uh, yeah, previous algorithms, for example, uh, one by index, and later it was even the factors of um, uh, the dependence on epsilon and logs were improved. And yeah, so basically there are very nice classical algorithms which show that such kind of bounded uh, vector update estimations are possible in the streaming model. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you for, for the talk. Um, and uh, now we'll go to the next paper, uh, which is Neo Quadratic Lower Bounds for Two Pass Graph Streaming Algorithms. All right, can I? Hi, so can I share my screen now? Yes, please go ahead. 
So Safari is giving the talk and this is a joint work with Renderize. Uh, great, so do people so see can you, can you check that your slides actually, okay, good. Are they moving? All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Are good. Interesting. Go ahead. Uh, okay, just give me one second. All right, so hi everyone and thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some multi-pass graph streaming lower bounds and this is joint work with Rand Ross at Princeton. Uh, sorry, okay, good. So uh, quick introduction, the streaming model is this nice model introduced by Alon Matias and Zegedi to try to capture the processing of massive data sets on the fly with a limited memory. So a typical example is how a switch operates in a network and it sees a very large amount of packets going through a very limited memory switch. And here in such a model, we really want to have something, uh, the memory of the switch, we can think of it as being exponentially smaller than the input size. But what if we want to solve graph problems? And it's quite easy to see that such restrictions are really restrictive for solving graph problems and this many graph problems. And uh, in some cases, this is a bit unnecessarily restrictive. For instance, think about it that suppose you have a social network, it's stored on your hard drive and you want to run a streaming algorithm to solve this problem, uh, some solve, uh, so, solve some problem over this graph. The reason a streaming algorithms are quite efficient here is that they are very IO efficient. So you can just go over your hard drive one time in one pass and then use the RAM of your computer to try to solve the problem. And here the memory of the streaming algorithm is proportional to the RAM of the computer. And so even if you can sometimes have even a quadratic saving in this space, it's going to be enough to be, for you to be able to run your algorithm. And again, in the same spirit, in such a scenario, it's not going to be totally a deal breaker if you couldn't solve the problem in one pass and allow yourself to look at your data one or a couple of more times. So based on these observations, Feigenbaum et al. introduced graph streaming model, which allow you to, have, to use more memory, often proportional to the number of vertices, which is n, or more passes, usually one, two, three, maybe even up to logarithmic number of passes. Let me say here is that the graph with n vertices have up to order n square edges. So if I give you memory of order n square, it trivializes the problem, you just store the graph. But anything beyond that, you have to use some, do something non-trivial to solve the problem. So what do we know about graph streaming? And let me tell you something about the state of the art with this caveat that I'm going to be like seriously oversimplifying things. And so, so that it uh, fits the message of this paper, basically. So with that caveat, now I can say that we have a relatively good understanding of single pass streaming algorithms. And in one sentence, exact problem seems to be hard for this. Uh, in this model, you, it's hard to find an exact minimum cut of a graph, exact perfect matching, I don't know, exact shortest path. They all require omega and a square space. An approximation seems to be doable. You can get some algorithms for approximating maximum matching, approximating maximum cut, minimum cut, usually in a space uh, O tilde n, which is called semi-streaming space. And uh, this was really an oversimplification as you already saw in the previous talk. We still do not know for many problems what is the right approximation factor and it's a highly active area of research. So I want to emphasize that. But on a high level, exact problems are hard in single pass, uh, approximate problems, let's say, are easy. So what do we know about multi-pass algorithms? Well, even such a vague picture do not exist anymore for multi-pass algorithms. I don't have time to go through the details, but let me just say on a high level, just give me one example. For instance, in, we know that finding an exact minimum cut of an undirected graph requires omega n square in one pass, but there are now actually algorithms that in just two passes are able to find a mean cut in just order n log n space. So even a problem which you may assume to be a really hard problem, you can solve it exactly in two passes. So that was the motivation behind this work, basically. It seems that already from two passes, we don't have a very good understanding of powers and limitation of graph streaming algorithms, and we wanted to know why. And there are two reasons. One is that it seems that multi-pass 
streaming algorithms are really powerful as we already saw in the example for MinPod and many other examples. But there is also the reason that we do not have good tools and a strong lower ones for proving multi-pass algorithms. And the second one is the purpose of this talk. Basically, we are going to try to prove some strong multi-pass algorithm, uh, multi-pass lower ones in the streaming model. And let's start with a very modest goal of just proving lower ones for two-pass algorithms. Cool. So now, based on that, let me tell you a result. We have studied a couple of prominent graph problems, trying to solve them using two-pass streaming algorithms. Some problems such as ST reachability in directed graph can S reach T or ST shortest path, what is the distance between S and T in an undirected graph or perfect matching. Does a given undirected bipartite graph have a perfect matching or not? And for all these problems, we know for quite some time that one pass algorithms require omega and a square space, but already for two pass, the lower ones were very off from the uh, only algorithm we know, which requires order and a square space and store the entire input. Cool. And let me just say that the, lower, the previous lower ones were something like n to the seven over six space, and they extend to multiple passes to roughly around log n passes by reducing the, num the space, like some dot exponentially number of passes. So what we prove is that for all these problems that I mentioned and a couple of other easy problems that follow from this, in two passes, you need almost quadratic space. So n to the two minus a small of one space is needed for solving these problems in two passes. And basically what it tells you is that effectively there is no non-trivial solution to these passes, even if I allow you two passes over your input. A bit more formally, what we prove is that for uh, all of these problems that I mentioned, any randomized uh, streaming algorithm that I'll put the answer with, let's say, constant probability of success, in two passes requires n square divided by two to the square root log n space. And what is this number? This is closely related to the best known construction of this so-called Rosa's Emerity graphs, which unfortunately in this talk, I will not have time to go through them, through the definition. Let me just mention that they, they are amazingly beautiful graphs and I've been finding more and more applications for proving graph streaming lower bonds starting from this nice work of Coel, Koprolov and Khan. So now in the rest of the talk, let me very quickly tell you how our approach looks like for proving the lower bond. And I'll focus on a stretchability problem. The remaining result follow from some easy reductions. Good. So our approach is to prove a, consider a new single pass problem. Think of the following graph. Think of the following problem. Let's say I have a graph G. It has a single vertex S, sorry. Good. There is this large set U of vertices. And I promised you that S can reach exactly one vertex chosen uniformly at random from this set. Try to find that vertex, okay? So S can reach exactly one vertex S star from this set U, find that vertex. Suppose we prove a lower bound for this problem, then we can create the following family of graphs. I'll pick two different copies of this graph and the graph on the right is in reverse direction, meaning that T is now reachable from a unique vertex T star. And then I'll put a random bipartite graph between these two target sets directed from left to right. Now it's very easy to see that the only way S can reach T if this edge between S star and T star exists in this graph. If the edge exists, this is the path. And if this edge doesn't exist, but the guarantees that I told you, there is no path from S to T in this graph. So now consider the stream that first give you the edges of this random bipartite graph, then E2 and then E3. So the algorithm can make two paths over these edges. And what we know is that in the first pass, it doesn't know which edge is important. So it's not going to be able to store it. In the remainder of the pass, it doesn't know what is S star and what is T star. So after the first pass, it still doesn't know what is S star and T star. So at the beginning of the second pass, it still is not able to store this important edge. And then when this edge pass, it doesn't matter. Even if you figure out what are S star and T star, you're not going to remember whether that particular edge existed or not and solve the problem. So with this thing that I tell you now, if you think about it, there is a serious problem with this approach. 
Uh, in particular, if you want to design an algorithm, you're not going to try to figure out what are SS star and TS star. It's enough that if you can just say that SS star belongs to some smaller set and TS star belongs to some smaller set. So originally we thought SS star and TS star belong to this big green set. After one round, after one pass over the input, if the algorithm can narrow down the choices for SS star and TS star, then the graph becomes something like this, and it can focus on just the edges between the potential choices of SS star and potential choices of TS star and try to just store those edges. And this way it's going to store a much, much smaller number of edges and solve the problem. Good. So the takeaway is that for such an approach to work, we need a very strong single pass lower one. And basically we have to prove a statement of the form after the first pass of the stream. There is absolutely almost nothing about SS star and TS star are known to the algorithm. And that's what we are proving. Uh, and this is where we are going to use this family of Rosas and Meredith graphs to create some hard instances of the problem. And then we use some proof something like uh, this notion of this a standard communication problem of set intersection. And we show that with a small communication, you again almost know nothing about the intersecting element. Then you put all these things through this uh, standard point and chasing type arguments and finalize the proof. And unfortunately, I didn't have the time to talk about any of these things, but in the longer talk, I speak, talk a bit more about this. Good. So let me quickly conclude. So we prove a bunch of uh, near quadratic uh, space lower bounds for two pass streaming algorithms. These were the main tools we use. Now for future to, uh, question, the first very interesting question is that usually it's hard to go from one pass to two passes, but, and we went there, but what can we do more than two passes? What are the lower bounds, for instance, for three passes and further? Uh, then this approach usually uh, most of graph streaming lower bounds uh, stop at log n passes. Can we start proving lower bounds even stronger than log n passes for these problems and related? And here we only know some sort of lower bounds for much harder problems. And then finally, I think the most interesting question to me is that uh, can we start to somehow characterize or understand what is really the power of, let's say, two pass streaming algorithm? Why can we solve a problem like mean cut in two passes, but we cannot solve reachability? And what are the problems we can expect to solve and what are the ones that are hard? And that's all I wanted to say, thank you. All right, thank you so much for the talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Is it okay. a yeah, go ahead. Um, is it okay to consider the uh, order of the stream as a part of the lower bound? Because I think in the in your approach, in a nutshell, you consider that the order of the input is, I mean, first we have E2 and E3. No, no, sorry. We have E1 and then we have E2 and E3. So is it okay to consider the order as a part of the lower bound? Good. Or the lower bound should for all of them. No, that's a very good question. Uh, there are many different ways of looking at the lower bonds. This version that I talk about is on adversarial order of streams. So even the order of the stream is chosen by adversary in addition to the graph. Uh, this is usually called like doubly adversarial. You may want to look at the case when the order is given in a random order and the problems become very different and people have studied them or lower ones do not work for random order, okay, at least as it is. And it's very nice to try to understand what happens also in the random order. And in the random order, the lower one would be harder to find, right? Yes, yes exactly. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so, I had a... Can, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, of course. So you mentioned at the end, like you talk about like undirected uh, distance. Mm -hmm. But I guess this is, all the results in the paper are for, for exactly computing the distance, right? Not for approximating the distance. Good. So, uh, good. So for approx, it's actually, it will give you something. So the lower bound is for distinguishing, I think, between paths of length, uh, I don't know, between five and seven, I think. So it will give you a five over seven approximation lower bound as well. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
Thank you. These are not long paths, but it's just that type of approximation follows immediately from that. Yep. Thanks. I also have a question. So what is the uh, upper bound? Like, is there a K pass upper bound for some K? Uh, for good. This I order? mean, yes, for very large K, I think reachability and shortest path around a square root n, you'll get to have some semi-streaming algorithms. Uh, in general, n squared divided by P space is almost always possible for P pass algorithms. Uh, yeah, so the trivial, uh, the trivial trade-off is almost always n squared divided by p a space for p pass algorithms. Okay. And for all of these problems, you can think you can design such algorithms. Uh, but there are also upper bonds which are more nuanced than this trivial upper bond. Like for instance, reachability can be solved in a square root n a space with just O tilde n s. Uh, sorry, a square root n passes with just O tilde n s space. Okay. Thank but you. we don't know whether that's the correct answer or not. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for very much for the talk. So uh, now we're going to get to the next talk, which is um, multipass graph streaming lower bounds for cycle counting, max cut matching, and other problems. Um, and um, who's giving the talk? Yeah, uh, I'm giving the talk. All right, okay. good. Okay. Uh, can people see my screen? See that slide? Okay. Yep, we can see it. Okay, thanks for the introduction. And this paper, we'll, I will also be talking about multipass lower bounds for graph streaming. Uh, and this is a joint work with Sefer Asadi, Gilad Ko, and Raghavan Saxena. Okay, so in this paper, uh, we studied graph problems in the streaming setting, and more specifically, an anode graph is presented as a sequence of edges or a stream of edges such that an algorithm tries to solve graph problems using very limited memory by making one a few passes of the stream. And the, and the important parameters here are the number of passes and the space usage. So how many passes the algorithm makes and how many bits of space it uses. Uh, and this is all sometimes also called the insertion only model because one can view the stream as a sequence of edge insertions to an initially empty graph and the input is to this graph problem is simply the graph after all insertions. And in this setting, there are two main areas. And the first area is called graph semi-streaming. And the goal is to get n polylog n space for problems on potentially dense graphs. For example, to uh, the problems of finding the minimum spanning tree or finding large, large matchings and spanners and so on. And for, such, for these problems in this, um, in, in this area, the output size is often large, say uh, linear or even slightly superlinear. And the goal is to use polylog m space per vertex. And, and the, the task here is to compress the edge space. So how do we solve the problem without storing the entire potentially dense graph? And the second area is called graph streaming. And the goal is to use polylog m space for estimating properties of the graph. For example, estimating the max cut value Max matching size and so on. And in this setting, the out output size is often uh, really small. It's a number or it's even a decision problem. And the goal is to compress the vertex space. So how do we solve the problem without storing something about every vertex? So I would like to emphasize that these two areas are usually quite different uh, in both the algorithms and the lower bound techniques. Uh, and in this paper, uh, we will actually focus on the second area, the graph streaming. And also, as already spoiled in the title, we'll be proving lower bounds. So the, the results of this paper will be showing that for certain problems in, in P passes, any algorithm solving this problem must use much more than polylog n space. OK, so uh, what is the problem that we study in this paper? So uh, the problem that we study, or actually the, it's actually a class of problems that we study uh, is the following. So we would like to decide uh, if a given graph G consists of many short cycles or a few long cycles. So the precise definition of this problem actually depends on the definition of many short and a few long. But intuitively, when the gap between many and a few and short and long is small, the, the two cases become closer and the problem becomes harder and it's easier for lower bounds and vice versa. So one such example was given uh, by Verbe and Yu in their 2011 paper, and they defined a problem called gap cycle counting and the, the problem asks to, defy, uh, to decide if uh, the input graph G is a disjoint union of K cycles or two K cycles. 
So there's a gap of two between uh, these two cases that we would like to distinguish. And they also prove uh, a strong lower bound for one path streaming algorithms. They prove that for any one path streaming algorithm, the space usage of this algorithm must be at least n to the one minus one over k. So before we get into the details of these problems and uh, lower bound proofs, uh, let, let's first briefly recap how streaming lower bounds are usually proved. So I guess uh, the most one, uh, one of the most common way to prove streaming lower bounds is by reducing from communication problems, uh, as we saw in previous talks. And this is also the approach that we take. So we are giving us data stream, uh, a stream of elements. And in this uh, setting of graph streaming, every element will be one edge. And we uh, consider the following communication game where with two players, where Alice gets first half of the stream, uh, in this case, half of the edges, and Bob gets the other half of the edges. And the goal of this communication game is to uh, solve the same graph problem by sending a few uh, short messages to each other. And uh, suppose there's a good uh, uh, streaming algorithm, then the players can use this streaming algorithm in to, to get a good communication protocol by sending the memories. For example, Alice can first simulate the streaming algorithm and first half of the stream based on her input, then sending the memory content of the, of the algorithm to Bob who will continue the simulation. And by this reduction, if there's a, a P pass C bit memory streaming algorithm, then we will get a communication protocol for this communication game with just two P minus one messages of C bits. So in order to prove a, 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 a streaming lower bound, it suffices to prove a lower bound for this communication problem. And the lower bound of the gap cycle counting problem that I mentioned earlier to distinguish between union of K cycles and uh, 2K cycles. This problem is proved via a reduction from some problem that is hard for one-way communication. It's called uh, Boolean hidden hypermatching. And the actual definition of this, uh, this, uh, of this uh, Boolean hidden hypermatching problem is not crucial for this talk. But I do want to mention that both uh, gap cycle counting and the BHH are very useful intermediate problems for proving one pass streaming lower bounds. And people have used them to prove lower bounds for uh, example for uh, uh, approximate max cut, uh, max matching, and the max uh, spanning, a uh, minimum spanning tree weight, and so on. Uh, but unfortunately, this problem BHH is actually easy when we allow more than one round of communication, um, when there's interaction. In fact, there's a protocol with just polylog and communication in just two rounds. And for this reason, even a two round lower bound for gap cycle counting was unknown. And so are the lower bounds for many other problems that are reduced from them. But many of these problems are uh, expected to be very hard problems, even in, in multi multiple passes. And the main contribution of this paper is that we proved multi-pass lower bounds for many of these problems by reducing from uh, a new communication game, uh, a new communication problem. So the communication problem that we consider uh, in this paper is called one on many cycles uh, problem. Uh, so in this problem, we're giving two disjoint perfect matches M A and M B on n vertices, and Alice is given the first matching, and Bob is given the second matching. And we'd like to solve a graph problem on the union of these two matchings. So G is a union of these two uh, matchings. And because these two matchings are disjoint and perfect, so G is guaranteed to be a true regular graph. And moreover, uh, we promise that this input graph G is either a length n Hamiltonian cycle, which is a yes case, or G is a disjoint union of n over k length k cycles. And this is the no case. And a k is some uh, fixed parameter that is known to the problem, that is fixed in the problem. And the goal of the players in this communication problem is to decide whether they are in the yes case or in a no case. So this is a, there's a very large gap between the yes case and no case, uh, so between the uh, lo many short cycles and a few long cycles. And intuitively, such this problem will be easy for the algorithms and making our lower bounds strong. And when k is, uh, is said to be a constant, this is probably the largest gap uh, one can get. And even for this uh, easy problem, we prove a lower bound, uh, we prove a multi-pass lower bound. We prove that any around protocol distinguish, distinguishing between these two uh, cases must send at least n to the one minus k to the one minus, uh, minus one over r bits. Uh, so let's uh, pass this, uh, this lower space lower bound. So n to the one minus uh, k to the one minus r. So when r is much smaller than log k, there's a term in the exponent 
uh, k to the minus one over r, this is going to be little of one. That means the exponent itself is going to be very close to one. So this means that the space is going to be very close to linear. So, so the, the takeaway message of, uh, of this main result is that either for this one or many cycle problem, either the number of runs is going to be uh, at, uh, at its law of k, or the space, uh, the communication is going to be almost linear. And our proof also extends uh, our low, the lower bound to the previous uh, problem distinguished between k cycles and 2k cycles with the same parameters. And by setting r equal to 1, this recovers the previous lower bound of n to the 1 minus 1 over k. So I guess in the last minute, last minute let me give a very high level overview uh, of the proof. So how we prove this lower bound. And the proof consists of two steps. And the first step is to prove that after one round of very small communication, so one player uh, who has one matching sends one short message to the other player, then after this, mes after this message, the players cannot find the two vertices that are at distance C from some vertex V and for any vertex V. So this is, uh, uh, so C is some large constant. Large constant. And uh, so they cannot, they not only cannot find them, but also have almost no idea what these two vertices are. So in the other words, the distribution, even condition on the message and the player's input is very close to uniform. Then the second uh, step of this proof is that we're going to first do this argument, the first message of the R round protocol, and then we're going to view the rest of the C minus one rounds of the protocol as distinguishing the two cases, which is similar to the original problem, but with the smaller parameters. So the, the yes case becomes a Hamiltonian cycle of length n over c, and the no case becomes n over k cycles of length k over c. So we both divide c in both n and k. And this is done by contracting c consecutive vertices uh, in the original graph. And you can verify that in the, these two cases, uh, when you contract in c consecutive vertices, it becomes uh, this. And then uh, by doing this argument uh, for r rounds, uh, when R is much smaller than log K, then we are left with a communication protocol with no communication and uh, a non-trivial pro protocol, a uh, non-trivial problem, and uh, this yields a contradiction. So this means that either the protocol has at least log K rounds, or the communication is large enough so that step one is, uh, is, is broken. And this is how we prove the lower bound. But uh, due to time constraints, I don't have time to go into the details and more details can be found in, in the long talk. So uh, in this talk, we uh, prove that, uh, in this paper, we prove that to, to distinguish between a Hamiltonian cycle and n over k, k cycles, uh, we must use at least log k passes or on null space. And thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. So um, I wanted to ask the audience if there are any questions. Um, so I have one quick question uh, in case yeah. there's no one else. Uh, like uh, last time I remember looking at this area, it seemed to me like people were doing a lot of um, kind of Fourier space lower bound, like which were very complicated. So how, how does your work kind of compare to those type, type of approaches? Yeah, so uh, there's one particular part of the proof which is corresponding to step one in this uh, argument that uh, there are previous works that mm -hmm. uh, did uses a Fourier analysis to this, and we directly use information theory. And uh, so in spirit, I feel the two approaches are quite different, uh, but I don't have a really good intuition why uh, the, the Fourier analysis are not going to give the same bound as we did, but it just the technique turns out to work uh, using directly using information theory. Uh, All right, sure this. Mm -hmm. Question. All right, thank you. Um, all right, um, if there are no other questions, uh, I guess we'll go to the next talk. Yeah, you can stop sharing. Uh, yes. Sorry. So uh, the next, uh, we're moving to kind of the distributed graph algorithms part of the session. So we're the first uh, talk in, the, in, in this kind of um, <clears throat> and subsection is uh, series lower bounds for ruling sets. And Sebastian is going to give the talk. Yes, yes. 
Okay, thanks uh, for the introduction. And this is joint work with Alkida and Dennis uh, from Freiburg. Now, uh, what I want to show is new lower bounds for an object called ruling sets in the distributed local model. So let me start by explaining what is a ruling set and I hope the slides move. Um, and ruling set or more specifically an alpha beta ruling set is a subset of the vertices of an input graph such that any two vertices that are in the ruling set have a distance of at least alpha and any vertex that is not in the ruling set has a distance of at most beta to the closest ruling set vertex. A special case of such a ruling set is a maximal independent set which is nothing else than a 2-1 ruling set. And if we look at these two parameters closely then we see that if we decrease alpha, the problem can only become easier. And similarly, if we increase beta, the problem also can only become easier. For us, this means since we want to prove lower bounds that we can restrict attention to two beta ruling sets and all the lower bounds we will get out of it will also immediately apply to all alpha beta ruling sets where alpha is at least two. Second thing to take away is that an MIS as a 2-1 ruling set is the hardest two-beta ruling set to compute. Ruling sets have been introduced by Averbuch, Goldberg, Lubin, and Plotkin in 89. And well, we are interested in them for a variety of reasons in the local model. One of them is that they are generalizations of, of maximum independent set, which in itself is one of the most important problems in the local model. But we can also use them uh, for a similar purpose as a so-called symmetry breaking subroutine in many algorithms for, for different problems in the local model. So let's have a look at what is known about the complexity of computing such a two beta ruling set. On the deterministic side, we know that we can compute ruling sets uh, both for beta equals one and for larger beta in polylog n time, where n is the number of vertices of the input graph. And this is a result that follows from the recent breakthrough uh, on network decompositions by Rossoni and Gaffari. On the lower bound side, we only have omega of log star n lower bound if beta is at least two. While for beta equals one, so for the problem of, of maximal independent set, we know that uh, at least log n divided by log log n rounds uh, are required. And of course, it would be great if we could somehow extend the lower bound or the construction of the lower bound to, to the case of uh, larger beta. But unfortunately, uh, the, the worst case instances in this lower bound constructions are line graphs. And for line graphs, we know that we can solve them uh, or find them in O of log star n time uh, for any beta that is at least two. So we need some different approach to, to obtain better lower bounds. And the second thing to take away from, from this line graph observation is that this lower bound by Balio et al does not hold on trees. So on trees for MIS, we only have the same omega of log star n lower bound. What we show is that Polylogarithmic in n time is required uh, to find a two beta ruling set, both for uh, MIS on trees or in general on trees, uh, and also for larger beta up to some polylogarithmic value. So, together with the upper bounds, with the, which are also polylogarithmic, we know that the right complexity is in the polylog n regime. We just don't know what is the right exponent, so to speak. And uh, on the on the randomized side, our lower bounds get exponentially worse. So we only have polylog log and lower bounds. Uh, let me not go too deeply into the upper bounds here. Uh, let me just say if beta is small, then these upper bounds are polylogarithmic in n. So there is still an exponential gap uh, between lower and upper bounds in the randomized case. All right, so before I tell you roughly how we uh, prove these bounds, let me say a few words about the model of computation that we use, which is the usual local model of distributed computation introduced by Lineal in 87. And um, well, in the local model, we want to solve some graph problem, but uh, not in a centralized fashion, but instead each vertex or node of the input graph is seen as a computational entity. And these entities work together to, uh, to solve the problem. Uh, the actual computation proceeds in synchronous rounds, where in each round, first each node sends an arbitrarily large message to each of its neighbors. And then when the messages have arrived, then each node is also allowed to uh, perform some arbitrarily complex local computation. In the beginning, each node is aware of its, of its own degree and maybe some graph parameters like n, the number of, of vertices of the graph and delta, the maximum degree of the input graph, but nothing beyond that. Then each node executes the same algorithm, which is what we call a distributed algorithm. And each node has to decide at some point that it terminates. And then it has to output its local part of the global solution to the problem. 
So for instance, if the problem is to find a maximum independent set, then each node has to output, I am in the maximum independent set or I'm not in the maximum independent set. And the induced global solution has indeed to be a maximum independent set. Our uh, measure of complexity, so the runtime of such a distributed algorithm is just the number of synchronous rounds until the last node terminates. And to avoid some trivial impossibilities, uh, each node is also equipped with some unique identifier of uh, all flock and bits. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the techniques we use. So the main technique uh, that we make use of is the so-called round elimination technique, which has the following idea. Say we want to find a lower bound for the complexity T0 of some given problem pi zero. Then what we do first is we find a problem pi one for which we can show that the complexity of pi one is at least one round less than the complexity of pi zero. Then we find a problem pi two for which we can show the complexity is at least one round less than the complexity of pi one and so on. And uh, when we get to a problem with index K for which we can show that the complexity is still strictly positive, then we know that since we lost at least one round of complexity in each step, that the initial problem pi zero that we are interested in must have a complexity of at least k plus one. And since such a sequence can be used to prove lower bounds, it is called a lower bound sequence. And uh, lower bound sequences have been used uh, to prove a number of results, most of them uh, in, in the last one or two years, but uh, still this technique is, is um, not well understood. So it's a very interesting uh, field of research. Uh, well, dual concept to that of a lower bound sequence is an upper bound sequence where we require that each subsequent problem um, has a complexity that is at most one round less than the complexity of the previous problem. And when we get to a problem with index k that we can actually solve in zero rounds, we know since we lost at most one round of complexity in each step, that the complexity of the initial problem can be at most k. Now, you may ask why am I telling you about upper bound sequences when our goal is to prove a lower bound sequence. And the reason is that to get our lower bound, what we actually want to do is we want to prove an upper bound and then somehow turn this upper bound into a lower bound. Uh, a bit more precisely what we want to do is we want to find some upper bound sequence, which will then give us an upper bound. And then we want to turn the sequence into uh, a lower bound sequence, which will give us our uh, desired lower bound. And in a sense, if we, well, can show that such an approach can work. This is good news because uh, essentially what we say is that we can reduce at least for some problems, the task of proving a lower bound to the task of proving an upper bound, which usually is perceived as something simpler. Now, I don't have time to go into much detail uh, about how the problems in, in the two sequences look precisely, but let me say at least a few words here. So the problems in our upper bound sequence will be a mixture of our two beta ruling set problem and a vertex coloring problem, where the number of colors that we allow in the problem will increase over the course of the sequence. And we, uh, we define the problems, or we show that we can find an upper bound sequence with these problems, uh, because in the end, when we get to a problem with uh, theta of delta squared colors, uh, we can show that this problem can be solved quickly in the local model. And the reason for that is that we just can find a theta of delta squared coloring quickly uh, in the local model. And that is enough to also find uh, the, this, this combined problem quickly. So in a sense, uh, this, this upper bound sequence gives us a gradual transition from uh, the two beta ruling set problem that we're interested in to a problem uh, for which we know that we can solve it fast in the, rulings, uh, in the, in the uh, local model. Now, to turn this upper bound sequence into a lower bound sequence, what we do is uh, we add wildcards to the problem, which is a technique which has been used uh, in, in a paper from last year's Fox in a slightly different context. So adding, say, three wildcards to some problem pi one means that the nodes still have to solve problem pi one, but each node also is allowed to put a wildcard on up to three incident edges and then it is allowed to violate the constraints of the problem on these three incident edges. In particular, uh, if uh, the wildcard is output on, on some edge, the two endpoints are allowed to output the same color. Now, this technique uh, doesn't preserve the quality of the, of the sequence. So our upper bound sequence that we start with will be longer than the lower bound sequence we end up with. 
So the upper bound will be uh, larger than the lower bound we get in the end, but uh, it will still be good enough to get a polylogarithmic lower bound. And uh, I hope that gives you a bit of an idea uh, how, we, how we get our lower bound. More details are of course in the longer talk and all the details are in the paper, but I'm also happy to answer any questions that you might have right now. Thanks. All right, thank you for the talk. Um, so are there any questions for, from the audience? Um, all right, so I, I'll, I have one question. So it seems to me um, like uh, the, your extending the this kind of round elimination technique um, which appeared last year in a very nice way so my question was uh, how hard is it to what when faced with a new problem to actually create this kind of round elimination sequence okay that is a great question so there is a result uh, from from last year that basically uh, gives a way to automatically construct such a sequence and this sequence that is automatically constructed will be both a lower and an upper bound sequence. So it will lose exactly one round of complexity in each step. Uh, but unfortunately, the problem with, with this automatically generated sequence is that the problem descriptions grow usually very fast. So uh, it can be grow, it can grow in, in well each of these steps already exponentially. So you cannot look at the whole problem or understand it in most cases, even after a small constant number of steps. So uh, many techniques uh, or the main way to, to, to deal with this problem is to uh, simplify the problems that you get out of this automatic sequence in a way that, um, well, gives you a much simpler description, which you can, again, put into, into this automatic problem generator, but uh, where you don't lose much complexity. So for the if you want to get the lower bound sequence, you want to find a new problem that is easier to, to describe that um, for which you know the complexity is not higher than the problem you started with, but you also hope that it is not much lower because otherwise you would like get a much worse lower bound uh, than you would hope for. And for an upper bound sequence, you want a problem that is much easier to describe, but where you can show that, uh, that the problem is at least as hard as the problem you started with. And uh, understanding how to relax problems such that you that you get these properties is i would say one of the main open problems uh that 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 one wants to understand in this context all right thank you for the answer um are there any kind of last questions from the audience all right so in this case uh, thank you again and uh, we'll and go to the last uh talk in the session uh, you can actually stop sharing your screen. Thanks. Uh, so the last talk in the session is this uh, deterministic distributed dis in the expander decomposition and rounding with applications to distributed de-randomization. And I saw you Jun, earlier. Okay. Yes. Um, Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Giving the talk. Yep. Uh, okay. All right, so, let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And in this talk, I will talk about deterministic distributed expander decomposition and routing with applications in distributed derandomization. And this is a joint work with Tasha Paul Saranurak from TTIC. Okay. So, uh, in, so let's begin with the computation model. So in, in this talk, the input graph will be identical to the communication network and the communication proceeds in synchronous rounds and the main complexity measure is the number of communication rounds. So, so far, everything is the same as the setting in the previous talk, but there is a difference. That is, uh, in this talk, uh, we consider the congest model of distributed computing. So uh, in, the, in this model, there are uh, two main features. So one is the locality constraint, that is each device can only communicate with its local neighbors. And the other one is the bandwidth constraint, that is uh, in each round, uh, at most all of log n bits of information can be transmitted along each edge. So 
so let me briefly review the relations of the congest model with other distributed models. So first of all, the congest model is simply the local model with a bandwidth constraint. And also, uh, it, it is convenient to view this congest model as a variant of the massively parallel computation model uh, that has the locality constraint. So uh, the reason that I say this is because that in both of the congest model and the MPC model, the, the number of bits that can be transmitted along, uh, the number of bits that can be communicated in each round uh, is, li is near linear in the number of edges, but in the congress model, there is an additional constraint that uh, require uh, each device can only communicate with its direct neighbors. Okay, so before we proceed to the main part of the talk, let me briefly uh, describe some basic graph parameters. So, uh, the volume of a vertex set is defined as the summation of the vertex degree in the set. And the conductance of a cut is defined by the number of cut edges divided by the minimum volume of both sides. And uh, so intuitively, the conductance of a cut measures the sparsity of the cut by taking the volume into consideration and the conductance of a graph is defined by the minimum conductance of a cut over all cuts. So if the, so the conductance of a graph measures how well connected the graph is. So if the graph has high conductance, then it is very well connected in the sense that there is no sparse cut. Okay, so in this talk, we will use the term expander to informally refer to high conductance graphs. And I guess one question that I need to explain is why expanders matter in distributed computing. So the reason that expanders are useful in distributed computing is because of a certain routing problem can be solved efficiently on expander graphs. So this connection between multi-commodity routing and, and expanders is already well established in the sequential setting, but in the setting of congest model in distributed computing, this was only considered relatively recently by a paper of Gaffari, Kuhn, and Su in Part C 2017. So more specifically, they show that the routing task where each vertex is a source and a destination of at most its degree messages can be routed efficiently in subpolynomial rounds. So why this is useful? The reason that it is useful is the following. So intuitively, Expander routing effectively removes the locality constraint of the congress model. And so this allows algorithm designers to focus only on dealing with the bandwidth constraint. So uh, this, the, the expander routing is a useful primitive for algorithm design. And indeed, after the initial, after the initial publication of the paper by Gaffari, Kuhn, and Su, there are already uh, plenty of applications of expander routings. And a highlight of these applications is that minimum spanning tree can be solved in subpolynomial rounds on expanders. And in particular, this overcomes a square root of n lower bounds that holds for general graphs. Okay, so at, at this moment, a natural question to consider is that, so we've already seen a lot of interesting applications of expander routings, but these applications ha have to be limited to expander graphs. So is it possible to extend this line of research to general graphs? And uh, 
a natural approach to do so is to consider expander decompositions. So what is an expander decomposition? An expander decomposition uh, of a graph is a removal of a small constant fraction of the edges in such a way that each remaining connected component has high conductance. And it is well known that such, an, such, an, such a decomposition exists and can be computed efficiently in the sequential setting. So uh, intuitively, if we can compute expander decomposition efficiently also in the congress model of distributed computing, then this might allow us to extend the aforementioned line of research from expander graphs to general graphs. Okay, so uh, in a recent work of myself with Seth Paddy and Heng Jie Zhang and Tajifo Sarah Nurak, we show that indeed expander decomposition can be constructed efficiently in the congress model of distributed computing. And also, indeed, uh, we can use expander decomposition to obtain some interesting result. And we show that triangle enumeration can be solved with near optimal round complexity using our distributed expander decomposition algorithm in the congress model. So uh, let me briefly uh, describe this algorithm. So the high level idea is that we first construct an expander decomposition and then in each uh, high, conduct, high conductance component, we can enumerate the triangles efficiently using expander routings. And then we deal with the inter-component edges using recursive calls. And then after our initial publication of distributed expander decomposition, uh, there are already several other works that use this expander decomposition to obtain many other interesting results. This includes uh, some near optimal algorithms and also uh, people are able to use expander decomposition to show barriers to prove uh, congress lower bounds. Okay, so now we are finally ready to uh, present the, our main result in this talk. So, so far, all previous work that we described so far are randomized because all previous distributed algorithms for expander decompositions and routing are randomized. And the main contribution of this work uh, is that we show the first efficient deterministic distributed algorithms for both expander decompositions and routings. And so this enables the possibility of the randomization of many existing randomized algorithms that are based on these tools. And in this paper, we show two simple applications. And also in this work, we give an improved randomized algorithm for expander decomposition. In particular, this is the first polylogarithmic round expander decomposition algorithm uh, with polylogarithmic parameters. And for comparison, the previous algorithm uh, will take uh, polynomial rounds. How much time do I have? So I guess uh, I'm running out of time. So long story short, uh, it is possible to reduce the expander decomposition problem to the problem of finding a certain sparse, to, to find a balanced sparse cut. And uh, to find this balanced sparse cut, what we do is that, um, is that we try to do a distributed implementation of a sequential balanced sparse cut algorithm of Chuzoi et al., which also appeared in this conference. And, uh, and then there are actually some challenges uh, in order to do a distributed implementation. And we overcame, we overcame these challenges. 
And also, coincidentally, the techniques underlying the distributed expander decomposition algorithm also allows us to solve the routing problem efficiently. And uh, th these are the main theorems of our work. And these are the open questions. So I guess maybe some of these open questions do not make sense because I omit the technical details, but these are interesting open questions and it, it will be great if some of you can solve some of these questions. And uh, uh, so if you are interested in this work and these questions, so please uh, watch the long talk on YouTube and read our paper. So I guess that's it for my talk. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you um, for the talk. Are there any questions from the audience? So I had a quick question. Um, seems like yeah, for go ahead. standard decomposition, like when you want to compute them sequentially, like when you care about the time complexity of in sequentially, you have to pay this two to the square root log n times log log n extra term compared to the information theoretic bound. Is there a way to use exponential time in congest and get the existential one for expander decomposition? Uh, sorry, I, I don't quite understand your question. So do you mean that if we like abuse the distributed model by using super polynomial time, do we get anything better? Time so, here is the time per node, not- The, lo the local computation time, right? Yes. Okay. So actually, I don't know because, uh, like in in our algorithm, it is actually the the local computation time is actually efficient. So I'm not sure if we abuse this this aspect of the model, do we get anything better? I don't know. Okay. Thanks.